Hi, I'm Tom from TC Tiny. Welcome to my series on a bushfire proofing tiny houses. Big question today is how the hell is that bushfire proof? And the short answer is that it's not bushfire proof, it's bushfire resistant. I use bushfire proofing methods to create a bushfire resistant house. One item on its own can be bushfire proof, but the entire house is simply too complex to have that title. But what fireproofing is, I find to be very poorly understood. The fire rarely catches fire to the exterior and burns through to the inside. It's the interior which is most vulnerable, and it's there which most bushfires find their ignition point. The first thing that people think of is the cladding. But bushfire proofing starts with the weak points. It starts with the vents, the windows, the doors, yeah. the roof spaces and the underfloor areas. It starts with the weak points, and only then is it required that you up the cladding. The cladding is almost certainly the strongest part of the house, the most resilient part of the house to fire from the beginning. Wind is also a huge factor. The strongest winds we have in Victoria are recorded within fires. Many houses have been blown apart before the fire ever got there. You can also get fluctuations in air pressure. Exceedingly high air pressures on the outside, extremely low pressures on the outside. And it can change within seconds. So you'll find my house has been extremely well constructed, tied down, extremely strong. You could even have smoke enter the interior from the exterior, making the interior inhospitable. A lot of my materials are intended not to transfer heat through to the interior. And for that reason, steel is one of the worst. I have a steel skin on this house, but it is absolutely sealed off from the interior. There is no thermal bridging through to the inside. One of my favorite fireproofing materials is timber. It's extremely stable under heat. It takes a long time to burn. These dense timbers are very difficult to ignite and it's an excellent insulator. It does not transfer heat through to the interior, which is exactly what I'm after. A timber frame is fine. The timber needs to be protected from the steel. The steel can get hot enough to ignite the timber on its own without other ignition. But once protected, the timber remains an excellent insulator and stable under heat. The intermediate wall there is built out of ply and sealed with fireproof caulking. It's to stop smoke and heat from entering the inside and protecting the wiring on the inside of it. The insulation is always fire resistant. There are several products which I've used in this house to achieve that. You can see it here with timber exposed, that's where the magnesium board is. Magnesium board does not transfer heat through to the tin. The rest of the cladding needed this insulation to protect the timber from the tin. You can see it here jammed underneath the tin right at the top against the fascia. Every orifice has been filled with insulation. When you tap it, it feels solid. It doesn't feel hollow. There's an enormous amount of fixings in it. Steel rivets, not aluminium. The magnesium board was corked together with fireproof cork before it was covered with steel strips. There's an entire episode on doors as well and how they will remain fire resistant. The door handles also fire resistant, no plastic in them. Windows are a huge weak point. There's an entire episode on windows and the shutters that are used to protect them. The shutters have timber and steel. This is so they remain non-combustible, but also stable during a fire. Glazing is a huge issue. They must be good quality double glazing so that it does not transfer the air temperature through to the interior. It's also toughened glass, so it's extremely difficult to break. I've done a lot of tests on all these materials as well. You can find them on my channel under the burn tests. The underfloor area is also affected. It's built to keep heat out. And magnesium board and fireproof caulking around screws. Fireproof silicon to block gaps under gutters, to block behind steel up against the windows as well. This is ember proofing. Between the door jam and the frame is also corked to fireproof cork. Gutters are a problem. There's a gap to make maintenance easier between the deck and the house. Tie downs for those exceptionally strong winds. There's no roof space. This is a cathedral ceiling. The house is largely very flat. There are few protrusions. Anything that's screwed to the outside is non-combustible including the pipes and services. And the doors have been filled with non-combustible seals inside and out. The species of timber is important. There are many that are fire resistant, must be selected well. 
service pipes, vents are a problem. The hot water service could be placed either away from the house or inside it, like I have in this case. The interior is fitted as much as possible with non-synthetic materials to avoid toxic smoke upon the heating up. Fireproof paint is very effective. It's underneath the aesthetic colours. The trailer is also affected. The tyres are highly combustible. They must be removed upon installation. The lighting could be a problem. They are combustible. If not corked properly behind it, fire from the light could burn through the interior. The joins on the cladding have also been covered and screwed well. Shishugi barn fascias. And the interior is built very lightly to allow for all this extra weight that I'm putting on the outside. I hope this has been a useful video. I must stress that it's not a fireproof bunker on wheels. It is intended to be here when you return from a fire. It's a life-saving device only that it allows people to leave and not stay behind to defend their properties. I believe very strongly in fireproofing and the community effects that it can be achieved if people are able to survive and return to their houses after a fire. I have based these houses on uh, the Australian standards for building in bushfire areas. However, those standards are firstly designed for large houses and I'm building a very small one. Uh, they're not designed for trailers, so I have to adapt them to that. And also, sometimes they seem to go a long way under what's required, and sometimes they go a bit over. So I do have to make up my own mind and do my own testing as part of the process. If you have questions about any of these measures, please watch my other videos and also leave a comment below. I'll get back to them as soon as possible. I do make appearances at several events throughout the year, tiny house festivals, library talks, sustainability fairs. I'm also available on Facebook and TC Tiny at Instagram. Thanks for watching. I'm Tom from TC Tiny.